All right, looks like most people are out of the halls. So Why don't we go ahead and get started? Good morning, everybody. How's the conference going so far? Good. I, I heard bacon donuts this morning. How can you how can you not be happy with a conference where there's bacon donuts? All right. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a ton of stuff, uh, but what it all boils down to is I nerded out and uh, wanted to build a smart garage door opener, and I'm cheap, uh, so that's what that's what my talk is all about. Um, I actually did it for under hundred dollars. It was close, uh, it, especially uh, if you're like me when you do a project, you end up going to the hardware store a few times. When I say a few, I mean anywhere from two to fifty. Um, and I never get the right amount, right? I went in, I was like, oh, I need some wire. How much do you need? I don't know, I didn't measure. Uh, but like this much? It's usually not that much. Uh, my name is Matt Milner. Uh, I'm an independent consultant. Uh, I split my time between doing hands-on development and doing training, uh, both in person and online uh, for Pluralsight and LinkedIn. Uh, when I'm not doing that, I have two uh, boys that keep me extremely busy and apparently only wear red Nike shirts, I just realized. Um, but uh, yeah, this is like six months old and the kid in the back, my oldest, is now as tall as me. So I also, my job is paying for new shoes and, and shirts. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about is my personal garage issues. Uh, so you can all be my therapists. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I've got one up here because uh, doing demos with just internet and Azure uh, isn't risky enough. I actually had to put some hardware in the mix that could fail as well. We're gonna talk a little bit about Windows 10 IoT Core, which is what's running on the Pi. Uh, I'll talk about what I, what I built, both uh, what I built on the Pi, which was the kind of the cool, uh, fun stuff, and then all the stuff I built uh, to support that. The, the app itself for the garage isn't all that complicated. It's all the stuff that I connected to it, um, which is typical for an app, right? You go and they say, oh, we just want you to build this app. And you're like, oh, that seems straightforward. And oh, we want this admin system. And you're going to know, because the admin system is the one with 50 screens and they have to be able to do everything. That's all the extra stuff that is in my solution. Um, so that's the plan. Um, you got a garage door, right? Lying uh, doesn't look quite like that. You got a Raspberry Pi. I had both of those things. And so it's kind of like uh, the old Reese's, right? Your peanut butter and your chocolate. And my goal was to not end up like this. This was kind of my fear that, all right, you're going to hook up some electronics that you built and put together to your garage door. You're probably either going to be parking in the street or taking the bus because your car is stuck in the garage. Um, but thankfully, so far, my garage door does not look like that so far. So here's my problem. Uh, this is my garage. On the, on the left there is the back corner of my house. So my garage is pivoted 90 degrees and disconnected. Uh, so there's a little walkway in between where you can get dripped on in the spring uh, by all the snow melting off the roof. Uh, but uh, I can't see that door, right? I can't see it from anywhere except the driveway where I took this picture, really. Uh, and in Minneapolis, uh, if you are familiar with Minneapolis, or if you're familiar with Nextdoor, there's two kinds of messages that you get on Nextdoor, which is like a neighborhood website thing. One is, uh, there was a loud bang last night. Was that fireworks or gunshots? It was fireworks at South Minneapolis. Uh, and two, uh, I left my car unlocked and people stole stuff out of it. You don't really need to post that one. We know that's what happens. Uh, also, uh, I have kids. My kids are great at a lot of things. Um, I, won't, you know, I won't do that proud parent thing and tell you all those. Instead, I'll tell you they're not good at turning off the light when they leave the room. They're not good at flushing the toilet before they leave the house. And they're not good at closing doors. So I'm constantly wondering, Hey, my kid was just outside. Is the garage open or is it closed? And I could ask them, but I don't usually get a good answer. Is the garage door open? I don't know. Weren't you just out in the garage? Yeah. Okay. That's the best view that I possibly could have. That's my kitchen window. And you can kind of see the edge of the garage door there. With the window closed, it's just enough that you can see the door frame. And so sometimes I, I kind of think that I know whether the door's open or closed or not, but um, unless I actually open the window, which I don't tend to do in, in the winter, uh, I can't tell if it's open. So that was my, that was my issue. Uh, I can't tell if it's open. Uh, and the other issue is I have one of those nice wireless keypads on the outside. You know, you just punch in the code and it opens the door. And when I bought the house a couple years ago, they said, oh, I think the batteries are dead on that. I was like, all right. So I put some new batteries in it. 
seemed to work okay, and then winter came. And apparently it's not that the battery's dead, it's that that thing doesn't work under about 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So uh, every, every winter, the keypad stops working and nobody can get into the garage without a, an opener. Uh, and so I wanted something convenient that I could use uh, with my phone. Now I've got three Raspberry Pis lying around my house. Why? Because I fancied that I would have some cool project I would do with them. To date, I've turned one of them into an arcade machine and the cabinet will still get built, maybe this summer, uh, but it actually runs and I can uh, you know, play some old arcade games like Centipede and Dig Dug. Uh, and then I had these other two. One was uh, to kind of entice my son to do some programming and he had all these great ideas about how he wanted to automate his room, but he didn't really want to do the work. Uh, he's not quite the nerd level yet that, that I need him to be. Uh, so instead he got an Alexa and some, some uh, smart lights and now he just talks to Alexa and, and asks her to set a, an alarm for him uh, and then turns his lights on and off. Um, which should tell you something about what we're going to talk about here. Uh, I, was, I was having lunch the other day and talking to a gentleman and, and he asked me about the, the talk and I explained what I did and he's like, you know, I just bought a new garage door opener and they have an app for my phone that I can just open it. It's like, yeah, but that's not fun. I didn't build it. Um, and I, and, and uh, honestly, I have seen some other issues that people have had with the security of those devices and how, how your data is transmitted and things like that. So um, yes, you could do that, but my garage door is probably 25 to 30 years old uh, and it's still working uh, and this was a fun project. So I had these pies and I knew that I could, could do a variety of things with them. I knew they were basically a powerful little computer, uh, but I hadn't really thought about other than the arcade uh, machine, what I was gonna do with it. Uh, and so, you know, if you, how many of you are familiar with the Pi? Most of you, good. Um, one of the things I notice when I look at it is the giant connectors on the back side. I was like, they could have made this a lot smaller, right? But I love the fact that there's a full-size HDMI output because I can just set it on the desk and plug it into my monitor. I can plug in full-size USB keyboards and stuff, no adapters and dongles. There's enough stuff hanging off of this thing. I don't need extra adapters and things like that. Um, and the Ethernet port comes in really handy when you're getting everything set up and, uh, and started, especially uh, building some of these, these things as we do with, uh, you know, with ROMs and flashing them on there and not being able to do full setup. Um, so what I want to take advantage of, at first I thought I'll just use the Bluetooth, and then I realized, no, that's, gonna, that's not going to work, and that's only going to work if I'm uh, nearby. And so I said, well, I want to take full advantage of the Raspberry Pi. And to me, one of the coolest things about the Pi is all of the general purpose input output or GPIO pins. Right? There's a whole series of these things on the side there and they allow you through code right, to go out and interface with a variety of different hardware items. <coughs> Excuse me. So you've got a couple different kinds of power pins. Right? You can do 3.3 volts or 5 volts of power. You've got ground, which it turns out is really important when you have power. Uh, you have input an output that you can do, right? So we have uh, some of these, like the, the orange ones down here at the bottom, the GPIO pins, those, right? I can set them up and I can decide, okay, am I sending signals out on this or am I gonna read signals in on this uh, from various devices? And then there's a bunch of them here that are labeled uh, and these change a bit uh, depending on the, the version of the Pi you have in some cases, but you've got some general purpose uh, pins there. You can see some of the purple ones, some of the other ones that are uh, longer label for special interfaces. You know, there's a UART interface for um, messing with the kernel and doing some lower level things. Uh, there's some um, SPI input output. There's some other um, special input output uh, pins that you can use if you're interfacing with certain kinds of devices. So this is where I really, um, I knew that this was available and I was like, oh, okay, this is gonna be really powerful, but man, I don't really, I'm, I'm not an electrician. Um, my mom will tell you that. Um, so repeatedly. Uh, I, I once changed the light, uh, I, I was trying to fix a light in the kitchen and I went in and I you know, flipped the circuit and the, the, made sure the disposal that was right there with the light and all that stuff was off and went in, changed the light, got it all changed uh, and then it just worked. I was like, well that's great. Hey, wait, didn't I turn the circuit off in the basement? Yeah, it was the wrong circuit. I was working with live, uh, live power lines. So some of this scared me a little bit. I was like, okay, luckily the pie is only about $35. I'm probably gonna fry it when I connect it to something. Um, but you know, if you follow the guides and you um, ground things and you actually you know, pay attention to what you're hooking it up to, uh, it's not that bad. 
My garage door still works even though this thing is hooked up to it. So I had the Pi. I'm not a big Linux person. I've installed it. I could install it. Um, but I'm a .NET guy. I know C Sharp. Uh, I know .NET. I know Windows. And so I was really excited about the idea that I could put Windows 10 on this little Raspberry Pi. And the IoT core, compared to Windows 10 full on, is tiny. Right? And it allows me to put it on the Raspberry Pi with the ARM processor. Um, I can set it up and use, use a full display. So I've got a 23-inch monitor at home. I plug that HDMI in. I've got keyboard and mouse, and I can you know, get a UI, it's pretty bare bones, uh, but I can get a UI and work with it. And I can run apps that have a UI, and I, you know, just like I would. So I build a UWP app in my Visual Studio, deploy it over to the Pi and run it, and then I can go in and I can uh, click on buttons, I can interact with the form, and take advantage of that uh, UI support. But with the Pi and with Windows IoT Core, I can also build a background app. So look, this doesn't have a UI. I just want it running on the Raspberry Pi, and I can configure it to run at startup. So you know, if the thing loses power and then comes back, reboots, that uh, app will restart. And so I'm able to leverage all of the C Sharp knowledge I have and the ability to build these UWP apps on the Pi, uh, which is great because you know, as I thought about uh, Arduinos and Pis and things, I was like, ah, I don't really want to write C. Uh, I've done enough of that. I, you know, I'd really like to do what I know. Uh, and, and focus on the hardware and, and playing with that. Now the other thing uh, that I've leveraged is this thing called the IoT dashboard, um, which I'll show you briefly, that allows you to manage these devices as well. So it's just a little um, click once app that you run. It can find the Windows 10 IoT core devices on your network, and then it can allow you to manage those things, uh, makes it easy for you to connect to them. Uh, they've got a little web portal you can connect to to see the apps that are running and, and manage them remotely. So I have my Pi and I've got uh, Windows 10, then I had to figure out, all right, well, I've got this door. I've got a couple things I need to be able to do. One, uh, I gotta be able to open it. So somehow I gotta be able to leverage the little wire coming out, of the, um, coming out of the garage door that goes to the button on the wall. I need to be able to send a signal on that thing through this Pi. And the other thing is, my biggest problem is I never know if the door's open. So how am I gonna know if that door is open or closed? Right? So here's the $100 part. I bought the Pi. You can actually get um, this kit now on Amazon, the, the can of kit, with the power supply and the case um, and the Pi for $55. And this is the new, I think it's the Raspberry Pi B Plus or something like that. Um, and then I got a door sensor, uh, and I brought one of those with me here. It looks slightly different, which is uh, because the one there didn't fit on my door. Um, that's why I have a scratched knuckle. Uh, of messing around with that thing near the, uh, the nice metal uh, frame, but it's basically a magnetic sensor, right? And so one piece goes on the door, one piece goes on the wall. When they're together, it's got one signal. When they're apart, it's got another signal. That was like $17, $18, super cheap. Even cheaper, a little relay. Um, I've got that up here as well. And the relay allows me to hook up the Pi and then send signals out to the garage door opener. I got the two port, or the two relays, uh, so I can have two different output pins, and I can signal then each of those different pins separately. So if you had a garage where you had two different doors, you could send different signals to each one and indicate which one you wanted to open. And the relay allows you to do some, um, you know, some jumping from the Pi's low power stuff up if you need to power something uh, more high powered. Uh, you can see on the, the top right there, there's a little jumper, and you can uh, come up later and take a look as well. That um, jumper's the power, so I've only got the five volts going to it. You could easily jump it to um, have two uh, power inputs as well. Okay. That, was, that was six something, that was seven dollars. And then I bought a ton of wires. Um, I bought a whole bag of wires, and then like I said, I went to the hardware store because I was in the garage and realized I gotta have some more uh, wire. I got a, the sensor that's on the door. I'm gonna have to wire that. So I went and just got some bell wire. It was like 29 cents a foot or something like that. Um, I think I got enough. Uh, everything's connected so far. Um, so between the pack of wires that I got, which are really nice for doing this kind of stuff where you're connecting off of the Pi, they've got little male and female ends. Uh, between those and the few dollars I spent on the bell wire, that was about $10. 
And at the end, you know, if you're interested, I've got uh, links in the slides if you want to go out and find these things as well. I've got direct links to go, uh, go find those. So let's take a look here at programming this. So you can see up here at the top, I've actually got this set up to debug on ARM in a remote machine. The remote machine is the Pi. It allows me to work in Visual Studio on a laptop so I don't have to sit wherever the, the Pi is and remotely deploy this thing just like I would on an emulator or on a device. Now if we go to the properties here. In the debug, you can, you'll see I can come in here and change that if I need to. Uh, I, I had to do that. I had my, uh, the original one for the garage door was plugged in to the Ethernet, and then I moved it to wireless, and everything um, kind of went uh, frizzy from that point. So I had to go in and repoint it. The IP address changed. All that stuff changed. So I had to come into the project. You'll also see that the authentication mode is universal, which sounds great, but then it's unencrypted. Uh, so something to keep in mind if you're working with these, uh, you know, if you're on a local network, it's probably not as big a deal, uh, but you are working across this unencrypted protocol as you do the debugging. All right. So the basics are that I'm going to work with these GPIO pins, and they've all got numbers, right? Um, we saw that on there. The Canna kits come with this nice little um, card where you can, you know, lay it down and see all those different pins, because on here, it's just a bunch of pins. They aren't color coded, they aren't labeled. Uh, and so I usually get this out and then I go like this and then I get my glasses uh, and then I pull out a flashlight because even with the light in my office I want bright light on there uh, to set those up. But each pin has a number and then we have a pin representation. And this first thing I'm gonna do is I have to initialize the GPIO controller. Now all this stuff is included, I just uh, like I said, I have the UWP app, I built that, I'm able to start using the uh, GPIO stuff automatically. I did have a, you know, there's a using statement, but I didn't have to add any references or do anything else. It's just under that windows.devices.gpio. The key is, it's only going to work on a Pi. I can't run this locally because there is no GPIO on my machine. Uh, so I have to have this and run this on the Pi <coughs> in order for this to work. But the first thing we do is get access to a controller. That's just a representation of uh, you know, some uh, software to manage the pins. And then from that, as long as we get a controller, we can go out and get a particular pin. So we open the pin, and then this one is my switch or my notifier. So on this example, I've got um, four things hooked up here three but one twice. I've got the door switch, so that's one that's going to give me an input when the doors open or close. Uh, I've got a button over here on my uh, breadboard, so that represents like my garage door button that I would push manually if I were in the garage. And then I have two outputs going to this relay, right, so represent going out to the, the two different garage doors. So I've got to set each of those up. So for the, the switch, this magnetic switch, I want to make sure I get the right uh, input mode. Right. So I can check whether it's uh, an input pull up, right, which is an indicator of how that thing is going to signal, and if not, it's an input. Right. Some of this is based on the uh, hardware, but a lot of it's based on the Pi as well. If you're running on a Pi versus on an Arduino or something else, uh, the, the hardware that you're running on might be different. It's good to check that and set the drive mode. Right. So how are we going to drive this pin? Is it input? Is it output? Uh, what kind of input output signal are we doing? And then I've set up this uh, debounce timeout, and that's so that you know if I hit the button and I accidentally double click, like um, pe my, people in my family always do, you know, when you're doing tech support, and it's like just click on that, and they click like three times, and you're like, no, just once. This helps that, right? So you say, hey, look, for that amount of time, we're just going to recognize that as one click. Right? And then it's just an event handler. Hey, let me know when it changed. All right? So the switch, if it opened, if it closed. It's just an event handler, and then I can look at the data and handle that. And so I do the same thing with the button. It's exactly the same, do the pinup mode uh, or the input pull mode, and we just have a separate handler for the button. And then for the outputs, here we're going to go out, open the pin, 
and then we do a write first. So we want to set the initial state of that thing, and then we set the drive mode to output. So in this case, the way I've got it set up, uh, I want to start with a, an initial high value, and then the other option, of course, is the low value. And I want to uh, write that out to the, the pin. So I want to kind of initialize it with a value before I get started. So then what I've got is just some those event handlers. So if you push the button, I get to see, all right, there's this notion of an edge, and it's either a rising edge or a falling edge. All right, if you think of the button, it's like you push down or come up. Uh, with the switch, it'll be, did it come together or did it come apart? So you can test that to get a sense of what happened, and then you can uh, act on that. So here I'm just going to toggle the uh, relay. For the button, I'm going to do relay pin 1. And for the switch, I'm going to do relay pin 2. And you can see here, I do it a little differently. With the button, it's just, you push the button, I'm going to turn the relay on or turn it off, whatever it isn't. Uh, for the switch, I actually want it to be specific. I want it to do the relay only when, um, only when it comes together. So when it's apart, I want it to toggle the, the relay off. <coughs> so, let's see if you guys can um, hear this little click, and you might be able to see the little lights uh, turn on on the relay. So I've got the button. It's plugged into these input pins. And then when I push that, it's going into the I.O. Right? We're getting the toggle. And now it's doing an output. And it set the output on the relay. And you can see the light stays on. The power is still on for that particular relay. I hit it again. That goes off. And then for the switch, same kind of thing. If we move that close, the magnet's going to start pulling stuff off. We move it away. Right? The light comes on. The light comes off. And so each of those is controlling a different side of that, which would allow me, like I said, to, to have different doors. Now, in my actual uh, implementation, I didn't use this to, obviously, to open the door. It sends a signal to the Pi, and I'm going to do something different with that in order to uh, let me know that the door has been opened. Questions at this point? That's kind of just the, the basic run through of you know, this little app to program the Pi, reading these inputs, or, and setting these outputs to the relay. Yeah, good question. You're able to debug this. This minute? No, because um, my Pi, I didn't uh, want to bring a monitor and get it all hooked up to the Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, at home, I plug this into the Ethernet or the Wi-Fi, and then I just hit F5, and it deploys it over to the Pi and set breakpoints in it and um, step through all of that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, good question. So the question is, what the heck does this setup look like uh, in your house? It looks a lot like this. It's a big jumble of wires. Um, yeah, the Raspberry Pi is just uh, in the wall on my garage. And then I've got three things coming into it. One is this uh, door sensor. So there's why, you know, this is mounted on the door, and the other side is mounted on the wall. And so that is wired over and coming into the Raspberry Pi. So that can signal it when the door opens and closes. Uh, I've got this relay hooked in, so that's my output to to the door. So what I did is I took the little you know the little manual button you have for your door, I took it off, and I um, took that wire that was connected to it and made that my output. So the Pi is essentially now the button, right? When it sends a signal, it's on that same old wire and it tells the door to open. However, knowing that this would break uh, at times, I didn't want to get rid of that button completely, so I just mounted it near the Pi, and now it's another input to the Raspberry Pi. So it, just like this button, when I hit it, it turns that relay on, my button at home does that. So now if you hit my garage door button, instead of it just directly signaling the door, it goes to the Pi, and the Pi relays it over. Yep. So the Pi sits between the button uh, and, the, and the opener, and it sits between the switch um, to indicate when that's open. Does that make sense? So once I had the, the hardware stuff done, and I was, you know, I had a setup like this. I was testing it on my desk, and I was like, okay, well, I got this, I got this working, right? I can, uh, when the switch opens, uh, it signals my Pi, great. When I push the button, it signals the relay. Uh, then I had to figure out, okay, well, that's all just sitting in my garage, uh, 
and basically all that does so far is let me push the old manual button and open my garage door. That's not really much better. Uh, so that's where I look to, how do I hook this thing up uh, in such a way that I can get information on my phone or on my laptop about what's going on with the door. Right? So Microsoft has this Azure IoT Hub. Right? And it's uh, far more massive than my one little garage door opener needs. Uh, it's really tuned for, hey, if I were going to commercialize this and I want to sell thousands of these things, the IoT Hub's really going to help me there. Because it allows me to do things like provision devices. That associates them with my Azure stuff. That gets them set up with uh, their own connection strings and device IDs <coughs> that, I can, um, that I can then use to manage those individual devices. It also provides, as the name hub implies, a set of messaging, right? Messaging back and forth to all of these different devices so that we can control them, so that we can monitor them. It does provide the monitoring, so you can uh, send up telemetry data and other information. And it supports multiple transports. So uh, queuing is a big one, uh, the MQTT and AMQP, uh, but also supports HTTP for certain operations. And then one of the things that they are really talking about, if you watched any of the, the build stuff, which unfortunately overlapped with us this week, uh, they're talking about edge processing. Right? My Raspberry Pi isn't super powerful in terms of what it, you think of as a computer would be, but it still has a lot of processing power. And they've, they were showing examples of, hey, we've got Linux running on the Raspberry Pi. We're going to run some containers on there. One of those containers is running Azure Functions in Azure Stack, right? Local, local Azure Functions. And so they spun up a whole bunch of containers on their Raspberry Pi. And now you can do a bunch of the processing local. So you're not dependent on always going out to Azure through messages and connecting up and, and leveraging Azure resources. You can run a, stuff, run a lot of stuff locally on the device to offload a lot of the processing from your cloud resources where you're going to get charged for them and to make it more responsive and, and make it handle stuff a lot quicker. So in terms of that messaging, this is what I really took advantage of. Uh, you have device to cloud. Right? So on the device in my UWP app, I can write code that says, hey, I want to send a message. I want to publish a message up to the Azure IoT Hub. And I can uh, serialize you know, some objects in there in some state. I can set metadata properties on it. I also have cloud to device. And this is really where I want to be able to um, control the device a bit, or I want to be able to send it data. So uh, I want to have a mobile app where I can say, hey, I want you to open the door. Or I can, you know, I get a notification that the door's, the door's been opened. My kid left it open. Um, my kids are getting all the blame here. If my kid left it open, I want to be able to do something about that. I don't want to be you know, on a trip somewhere uh, out on the West Coast and find out, oh, the garage door is open. I call my neighbor, I guess, and ask him to go close it. I wanted to have the ability from my phone or from my machine to say, great, close the door. Uh, and that, you know, again, that's one of the reasons I went away from Bluetooth. I was like, no, I want this to be anywhere. If the door is open and I'm anywhere in the world, I want to be able to close it. Then there's the notion of direct methods. And this is uh, similar to the cloud to device, but it's really, I need a response from that, right? So for example, uh, I might want to go out and specifically say, hey, Raspberry Pi, is the door open or is it closed? Right? I, want a, I want a response and I want a direct response. I don't want just a notification that the door opened while I'm uh, over here. I want to know right now, can you talk to the Raspberry Pi from the cloud and get me back a status of that sensor, right? Is it open or closed? There's also this notion of device twins, and this is really kind of a state management thing, where uh, your device sitting out uh, wherever it is in the world has a metadata that's associated with it that sits up in Azure. And so this is just a JSON document that has uh, status information, but you could then go into Azure and set properties on there, and they'll get synced down to the device, right, and vice versa. So it's a way for you to, uh, to manage the device through this uh, this twin that you have up in Azure. So here's how I tied all this stuff together and all the different pieces I use, and then we'll look at the actual uh, solution. So I've got my garage door, I've got my Raspberry Pi, and I want to deal with this with my phone. One of the things I found, I, I thought, <clears throat> hey, the, you know, I've got the Azure IoT Hub, and it's, I'm able to send messages to it. Why don't I just do that from the phone? Well, it turns out that the protocol supported for talking to the Azure IoT Hub weren't going to be supported on all the phones I want to support. So I ended up building 
just a, an API, very simple web API, ASP.NET Core, that I can host up in Azure App Service that gives me a couple operations, right? Open, close, get the door status. And that then has a connection over to the IoT Hub. So now I'm just doing a simple REST call from my mobile application. I can say, hey, call out to the service, here's an ID, let me know if that garage is open or closed. Right? Do a direct message to it and find out. Or, yeah, I want to open that, send a message over to that door that I want it to open. Now on the other side, we've got that sensor. Right? So when the device says, hey, the door just opened, Great, well I wanna know that, so I need some sort of a notification. So I've set it up so that when there's a device to cloud message, and the device sends up to Azure IoT Hub and says the door just opened, then I'm gonna pop that over onto a service bus queue, and that's just gonna go through a little flow here where it forwards. I'm gonna get a, uh, just a simple Azure function that's gonna take that message and turn it into a push notification template. Right? Hey, I know what the device is that just opened, I'm going to take that, turn it into a push notification template, and I'm going to hand that off to uh, Azure Notification Hubs. All right, so I just mentioned three things all at once right there, uh, all, all together. We've got Service Bus Queue, an Azure Function, and a Notification Hub. How many of you are familiar with Azure Functions? A handful, okay. Microsoft is talking a lot about them. They talk about serverless, right? This is just an op, uh, opportunity for you just to write code. I have uh, literally two methods. It's a method that gets invoked and is, is just hosted and run for me out in Azure. So I don't need a full app. I don't need to do the full deploy. It's just a function. And it's bound up uh, with inputs and outputs. So it gets triggered by a message on a queue. And it has an output to drop something over on the notification hub. Um, the Azure Notification Hubs is a push notification uh, system to simplify your life. So uh, think about you know your iPhone, your Android phone, your Windows machines. Um, they also support uh, Kindles and and Baidu and some other things that are that are big in China. Um, the idea is I want to push notifications to your devices, right? I want to give you those alerts. I want to give you those badges, uh, but I don't want to have to figure out how to talk directly to Apple's push notification and Google's cloud messaging and the Windows notification service. They've already done that. All I have to do is go configure and say, hey, here's my secrets, right? Here's my certificate for Apple. Here's my uh, keys for Google and for, for Windows. And I don't want to deal with doing the push. I want you to do it for me. So I'll call you and say, hey, here's the, here's the message. Here's the push that I want to do. Maybe provide some attributes about how to target it. And then the notification hub handles talking to all those different services and pushing out to, you know, whether it's three phones for my, uh, my garage door or whether it's millions of phones for things like uh, you know, Microsoft's News app or Apple News, those sorts of things. So that then can send notifications over to my, uh, my device. So what does all that actually look like? Let's start with the with the, the app that's running on my Pi. So this is similar to what we had up here, but this is the specific one that's running. And you can see I've, I've got it set up as a background task. So this one has no UI, there's no uh, screen where I can go push buttons or do anything. Uh, and so when I start up, the first thing I have to do is get this deferral. Otherwise the app starts and then it shuts down. So you have to get the deferral and say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna go do some asynchronous work. Uh, I'm gonna be out here running. Unless I call complete on that deferral, please keep me running. And then I just set up a garage door that uh, encapsulates my logic, and I initialize that. And you're going to recognize a lot of this code. If I go to the init, oops, right? it's all that stuff we just looked at. So I'm opening up the uh, pins for the switch, for the button, and then for the relay out. Now, one of the things I had to do different is I've got that toggle the door. Um, you'll notice when I do the, um, do the relay, right, if I put these things together, the signal stays on. Well, typically when you open your garage door, you don't want a signal, you don't want to sit there holding the button 
on the garage door constantly, right? And so I set this up to just say, hey, I want you to go send a signal on the pin and then turn it off, right? Just like it's a button push on the relay. I want you to um, write the low value, which is, turns it on, and then after a second, I want you to go ahead and, and write it back to the high value. And I could probably back that off to more like a half a second or less, but I wanted to make sure it actually read it. So what happens then when we open the door? If we open it, I do a little check and I say, well, what just opened it? Because if it was the application, right, if I just on my phone just said, hey, open the door, I don't need a push notification. I don't need you to tell me, right, I just opened it. So if the app opened it, if it came from a cloud message of some sort and the application did it, then um, they don't really need to do anything, right? Uh, and so what I'm doing is I'm saying, yep, it, uh, the door just opened, right? We're toggling it to open. Uh, and then I'm going to sleep for a bit and indicate uh, that back to a false, right? And the reason I'm doing that is once we open it, remember the switch is going to toggle and it's going to send a little notification to the Pi and say, hey, I just opened. So when that happens, this is where I check that little flag. I say, well, did we just open it? Did the app just open it? And if so, then I don't need to do anything. But if it wasn't, if somebody pushed the button or used the, the garage door remote, then I want to notify through the push notifications or I want to send that app message up to the IoT hub. So I'm just going to take, uh, it's a JSON object. I take that and I just put it into a, a byte array. Right? And then I use this device client. And this is the SDK that I've got to work with the IoT Hub. It's just a NuGet package that allows me now to send messages from my Raspberry Pi up to that hub. It's got a connection string. My hub's got a name. Right? Um, lots of the Azure messaging uh, systems, service bus queues and other things, follow this exact same pattern. So I just set that up, I say it's an open notification message type, and I pass that up to the hub. Now at this point, my device doesn't care what happens with it. All it knows is I need to notify the hub, the hub might throw it away, the hub might use it as telemetry data, um, the hub might then do something with it, as we saw, and pass it on. So in our case, if we go look at that, here's my IoT hub out in Azure. We'll see a couple of things out here. If we go down and look. There we go. There we go, IoT devices. You can see there's my uh, garage. All right, there's my one device that I've associated with this hub. And it's all set up. And you can see over on the right, it says cloud to device messages. Right? Are there any messages queued up that need to get sent down to the device. So if I send an open or a close request, that I want to go down to the device. So there's our device, and then we also have this notion of endpoints. So the, at the top, those are the built-in endpoints. So we have the cloud to device, uh, and then we have these events. So that's where those messages are coming up from the device. <coughs> All of these are built on top of event hubs. This is one of the things that, I, um, that I've found over the years with Azure. Um, you know, when you come in and you, you like, oh, I want to learn this one thing. Well, too bad, because it's built on five other things. Uh, and you might need to understand those things as well. Right? This is one of those cases where, hey, there's already a whole model for sending events right, at scale and managing those things. IoT Hub just layers on top of event hubs and says, hey, look, when you create an IoT Hub, we're just going to automatically, under the covers, provision an event hub for you, and we'll use that for the messaging. The plus side is you can access those using any of the event hub libraries. So if you're already sending and receiving lots of data, you can plug into those uh, event hubs, and you can read those messages. Up. Now, at the bottom, again, I'm cheap, so I've got one of the, the low-end uh, IoT hubs. I've got one other custom endpoint that I can add. 
and that's just pointing to the service bus queue. Now, as an endpoint, it doesn't really do anything, but what IoT Hub lets me do is set up routes. So I have these open notifications. I could say, all right, anything coming from the device messages, right, I want to route it to that service bus queue endpoint, and here's my filter, here's my query string. So if those things come up and the message type in the metadata says open notification, then great, take this uh, message and forward it over to that service bus queue. And now I can do whatever I want with it. I can build uh, subscriptions off of there. Uh, I can, can read those messages off the queue as I can ingest it. And then you can test it out if you want to um, send it over to the queue and, and make sure it's all showing up like you want. So message comes up, the route kicks in, says, okay, I'll put this on the queue. Uh, and then we've got our uh, function that kicks in from there. So I've got my Azure function here. Actually got two of them set up because I was trying something different here. There's the one that's working. I'm first going to look at the uh, the integrate tab. You can see the trigger is a service bus queue. So I just the nice thing about functions is I don't actually have to program against the service bus. I just say, hey, kick off this function and invoke it anytime a message shows up on this queue. And then on the right, I've got the output of the notification hub. Where I say, hey, one of the outputs of my function is going to be this notification. Again, I don't want to write to the API. I don't want to program all that. Just hook it all up for me. So we now have a function that takes in a message from a queue and sends out a notification. And if we go look at the function, you can see there's my run method. Brokered message is a, a typed uh, class that we can use for messages off the service bus queue. And that lets us get at the, uh, the metadata, the properties of that message, and not just the, the body. And then I have this out uh, I dictionary of string string. That's my template parameters for my push notification. Um, so those are going to get popped into um, those are going to get popped into the notification when it goes to the different devices. And the bottom is just essentially hooking those two things up, right? Taking some properties out of the service bus queue message, formatting them into this dictionary so that I can send it, and then returning that. So I have an input queue message. I have an output notification that's a dictionary. And I don't have to program to any of those uh, systems. This is, this is the extent of my function that does all that work for me. All right, so the final piece of that then is I have this notification hub. If we go and look, you can see uh, I've set up Windows. So all I had to do, I had to go out to the, you know, the Windows Developer Center and give them a, uh, set up an app there. And then I had to go out to the Apple site and get my certificate. Then I'm able to just upload the certificate, plug in those credentials, and that's all I need for Notification Hub now to be able to send push notifications to these services. And I can start invoking its APIs and say, hey, send this message. Uh, and it's got options for you. You can, you can be very specific and say, hey, send an Apple push notification. That's only going to go to Apple devices that are uh, hooked up to your hub. Right? Send a Windows uh, push notification. Or what I did is I said, I want to do a template, right? I'm going to uh, just send that dictionary of values, and each device will, when it registers, will indicate where those values get plugged into the notification. So what that ends up looking like here is, that's my device ID. Um, this one's a little bit old. You can see it's from last night when my Wi-Fi at home was actually working. Uh, and the garage door opened uh, in the evening, and it sent me a push notification and said, hey, you know, that door opened. And then I realized that was a horrible notification message, so I added that text uh, to do that. So the other piece was I wanted to be able to, uh, when we initialize this, I need to be able to uh, get those messages about whether or not the door is open. Close this up. 
<clears throat> so you can see I've got that device client. I just do this create from connection string uh, that comes off the portal directly. And then I'm calling the set method handler async, saying, hey, if this thing uh, gets a direct message, right, we try and get a direct message, and the, the message or the method is is door open, here's a handler, right? Here's a local function that I want you to invoke when that comes through the IoT hub. And so it's very simple for me just to map that up and say, hey, here's my direct message, or method, it's is door open. And then we go down and we, and we pick that, where is it? There we go, handle is open. And I've just set up, do some JSON uh, manipulation there, and set up that message and send back the response. So you get a method request, you create a method response and send it back. So this will get invoked when I uh, go out and call that. And I say, hey, is that open? Goes through the hub, down to the device, back through the hub, and back to the call. So the other piece uh, I'll mention is the, um, is the API, because it uses the other side. So that was using that client SDK. If I go to my uh, API, see here, I have this, the server side or the uh, non-device side of the IoT hub, right? I want to control the device, I want to talk to the device. Uh, it's a separate SDK. But here, again, I can create a client from that connection string <clears throat> and I can do that invoke device method async. Right? So here's the device I want to talk to, here's the method is door open. Go and execute that and get me back the response. So a few lines of code, relays it through the IoT hub, down to the device, and then gets the response back. Now again, this I wrapped in the API because it was using uh, some of those queued based transports as opposed to HTTP, and so I couldn't get it to work on all of the phones. Uh, so I, I just wrapped it up in this API to make it a little easier. All right. So let's see, so here's my issue right now. And that is um, that my Wi-Fi at home, like two days ago on Tuesday, I moved the router across my office. That's all I did. I was like, okay, my garage is kind of far away. Uh, I'm going to see if I can move this a little closer. So I moved it from a desk in the front of my office, literally eight feet away to a desk in the back of my office. I spent three hours trying to get my Wi-Fi back. Um, I plugged in all the same cables, everything. I had to reset the modem three times. Uh, so, my Wi Fi is a little flaky, which means right now, unfortunately, this isn't actually going to connect to my um, garage. So, one of the things I need to do, future proof this, is I need to put a repeater or do something um, towards the back of the, uh, towards the back of the house to get this to work. Uh, but these just basically go and call that API, right? Open the door, close the door, or get the status. Uh, and so, it calls out to that API and um, tries to get me back those, uh, those results. So I've got that, uh, I've got the app, I've got it running here on Windows so you can see it, but I've also got it um, running on my iPhone. Uh, I need to, to finish the Android one, but um, that's for my son. I'm not, too, I'm not too worried about him being able to open and close the door remotely. Uh, but I've got a couple of other ideas for uh, ways to improve this. One is I'd like to have a webcam. All right? I'd like to hook up a webcam to the, to the Pi uh, and be able to either grab a snapshot or get a live feed um, just for that kind of visual uh, kind of um, assurance that, yeah, it says it's closed. I'd really like to be able to see if my door is closed right now. Um, and the other thing would be uh, from the device, having another output that uh, is maybe like a light you know, so, or something, some indicator in the house where I don't have to pull out my phone because I'm getting even more lazy, right? I don't even want to have to pull out my phone or check a device. It would be nice just to have something in the house, since we can't see the door, that would just be on or off, uh, right? Which would be very easy to just tie into that uh, switch. Um, the other thing is uh, opening up an app just to open the door or check the status can be tedious. So I want to work on the mobile apps uh, and add like widgets, right? I want to put on like on iOS, you have the little widgets on the side. I just want to be able to swipe over and, and see it and have some quick actions uh, or widgets on Android. Um, and I don't know that iOS is going to support this, but I want to look at voice too. You know? So when you're driving up to the house, uh, you can say, you know, hey Siri, open my door or open door number one or something like that. 
Uh, and then the other is I secured the API, so I forced, uh, forced people to log in, uh, but I need to go back and make that a little tighter and, and figure out, all right, how do I manage the users, right? It's, it's not enough that you logged in with a you know, Microsoft account. I want to restrict it to a certain set of users. Now, beyond that, one of the things uh, is that, you know, this is, this is my garage. This is my prototype. This is, um, if you saw it in my garage, you would not be impressed and go, oh, I want one of those. Um, but you can commercialize these things, and that's where a lot of the Azure IoT Hub and the Windows uh, 10 IoT, IoT Core come in, is that you can um, take that package, right, and you can commercialize it. And that involves a lot more work, because that means you've got to have uh, certain kinds of devices. Uh, it means that you've got to uh, provision those things and have unique IDs for them and control over them. Uh, and you've got to do some licensing around the Windows 10 IoT Core. But the other key thing is security. Right? I said, you know, I want to secure the API, but the device itself is running and has connection strings uh, in the app. Right? Wouldn't be too hard for somebody to go in and, and find that information. And so you can use the Trusted Platform Module, or TPM. Right? So you can store the connect, at, excuse me, you can store the Azure IoT Hub connection information in that trusted platform module. Now the Pi doesn't have one out of the box. So they do have a software one, it doesn't work. Um, it, it, uh, it allows you to basically securely store those connection strings and those keys on the device, right? And so uh, somebody can't just go in and, and look at your code and find those things. Uh, so those are the kind of things, if you think about taking a, a product and actually you know, packaging it up, um, you're gonna have to make sure, right, do I have the right kind of board? Is the Pi the thing that I want? Uh, is there a custom pie uh, that might have additional things on it? Uh, how do I secure those items? How do I provision, you know, however many of these devices we're going to need with unique values, uh, with information about, uh, you know, how do you tie those things together? Uh, okay, well, I have device ID and here's this GUID. How is that tied into, you know, Jesse's door or Jesse's door one or two? Um, so those are some of the things that you'd need to think about uh, going forward. So I, as I said, uh, this is all... Uh, just short links to where I got the stuff out at uh, Amazon. So if it's something that you want to grab, uh, you can go out and find those particular uh, items. I will say a couple notes uh, on the on the switch, right? Uh, the sensor. Take a look at the different options. Uh, the company I bought this from is is uh, great. Again, they're cheap. They're sturdy. Uh, this thing can sit on the floor and get run over by a car. Uh, if you want to mount it to the floor, I didn't feel like I'm drilling into concrete. Um, but you can, you know, you may find uh, ones that fit your door better, depending on how thick it is, how big it is, um, to get that. Um, the other thing is on the bottom is, is I call it the fun kit. It's basically a box with a bunch of stuff, right? More wires, uh, lights, resistors, um, buttons, uh, the breadboard, all that stuff. So if you're going to start with this and you want to start playing around, um, that was something that was, you know, $15 or, or something like that. It just has a ton of stuff where you can start playing with the inputs and outputs uh, to, to start uh, getting a feel for how to write the code, how to get that hardware all hooked up. So, with that, any questions on the Azure part, the Pi part, any of that stuff? Any suggestions for what else I should be thinking about to future-proof this? Yep. Oh, that's a good question. So the the question was if you've got those the, the little lasers that they put on garage doors now so that when they're closing, if I walk through, it stops it and goes back up. You're saying, could I put something like that on the, on the, like the access door that somebody walks through? So if they were walking through it, it would also stop it? Oh, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, good point. So, so the point was if I have those lasers and somebody walks out, uh, then I could trigger the pie and say, hey, somebody just left. Uh, the door's open. Now I want to close it. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure um, how well those work, though, because then if somebody walks in versus out, I don't know that that would tell you. It's more of a the beam broke, but... Yep. Yep, yeah, you could absolutely say, hey, if the door's open and somebody just walked through those, close it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
-hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, so we've got all the, the edge processing, and we've got all this connectivity. What happens when you can't actually talk to it? Um, yeah, that is one thing, and um, I actually thought about building a slide for that, because I figured somebody would be like, well, what if the power's out? Well, if the power's out, my garage door doesn't work anyway. Um, so I'm not too worried about that, but yeah, if the Wi-Fi was out, which apparently is a big issue at my house, um, you could certainly set it up and do um, do some direct connections over like Bluetooth and talk to the Raspberry Pi over Bluetooth from your phone or from another device and say, hey, I want to I want to go do this operation. So in the app, you'd have to be listening and, and connecting to those things, so that's another option. I do, so good question. If the power goes out and then comes back on, Will this restart? Um, yes, uh, you may have noticed this uh, little guy has no uh, no screen, no mouse, no anything, and I just brought it in here and plugged it in, but my app is running that's making these switches go. Um, and that's the same thing with my garage door opener. I set it up as a background task, and I also set it up to run on startup. Uh, and that's all stuff you can do through the little portal that the Windows IoT Core provides. It's just a little web, um, Website, it's got an apps manager, and so you can go in and find the apps and say, oh, there's that app that I was debugging and deployed. I want that to run at startup. Um, it also allows you to start and stop them remotely. So you know, if you don't have your debug machine, you could go and say, oh, start that app on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, for background tasks, you can have a number of them. So at home, my garage door opener is running as a background task alongside some of the other ones. For a visual one, like what's running on here, you can only have one. So it's, it's kind of like the, the shell, right? When the, when the Pi starts up, it runs my app, and that's it. There's no, even the minimalist UI um, from the, the Windows IoT core, but that allows you to, yeah, when it restarts, the app is running. Yeah, even when I have bad Wi-Fi, the button in the garage still works, which is a big plus, right? Because the app's still running, it still gets the signal and relays it over to the door. So even if it's not on the Wi-Fi and doing what it's supposed to, I didn't completely um, break my door, it still works. Any other questions? All right, well, feel free to stop up if you want and, and uh, play with any of the hardware or look at some of these things, and I'll stick around for a few minutes for uh, other questions. And thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.